chapter twenty nine of monte cristo's daughter by edmund flagg this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty nine vampa's trial the successful result of the raid upon the bandits made monte cristo and captain morrel the heroes of the hour in rome everywhere they went crowds assembled to gaze upon them and they were greeted with hearty cheers and loud acclamations of joy truth to tell the roman people both high and low had very much to thank them for the outlaws band was completely broken up and every member of it was safely bestowed in the dungeons of the castle of sant angelo where as already stated the redoubtable leader the notorious brigand chief luigi vampa himself also languished awaiting whatever disposition the authorities might choose to make of him with anything but stoicism for he did not doubt that it would go hard with him vampa's arrest was considered as directly due to monte cristo for had he not come to visit the count it was improbable that he would ever have been captured by the advice of monte cristo also the bandits subterranean retreat had been filled with powder and blown to atoms no wonder therefore the romans were grateful to the illustrious frenchman and his able assistant captain morrel old pasquale solara had been placed in a hospital where he was closely watched and had the attendance of a competent physician for the count had assured cardinal monte that he could perhaps be made an important witness against vampa at his forthcoming trial after examining the shepherd's wound the physician had given his opinion that it was fatal but that by resorting to proper and judicious measures the old man's life could be prolonged sufficiently to enable him to testify valentine was much affected when she heard from zuleika's lips the story of her seizure by the brigands and her imprisonment in the dark damp cell of their cavern fastness but her emotion was tempered with joy that her beloved friend had escaped with no other injury than the shock resulting from her fright and natural apprehensions when giovanni learned of his betrothed's dangerous adventure and the perils that had encompassed her his indignation knew no bounds and in addition he felt considerably hurt that monte cristo had not allowed him to participate in her rescue the count and his daughter however succeeded in calming him and in convincing him that all had been done for the best he was further propitiated by monte cristo's assurance that he could now act openly and without fear of prejudicing his case as the criminals were secured and the end was surely approaching cardinal monte decided that vampa's trial should take place within a week and that the first charge investigated should be that relating to the abduction of annunziata solara and the conspiracy against the viscount massetti this decision was brought about by the influence of the count of monte cristo who represented to the papal secretary of state the importance of utilizing the testimony of old pasquale solara while he was yet in a condition to give it the count resolved to make a final effort to convince annunziata solara of giovanni's innocence though he had determined to employ her evidence in any event trusting to the lawyers and the court to extract such admissions from her as would tend to show that she was mistaken in regard to the identity of her abductor he knew the former flower-girl was conscientious and firmly believed in her theory but still he was not without hope that she might be led to see matters as they really were besides if her father should see fit to confess she could not fail to be convinced of vampa's guilt and in that case the expression of her conviction would be of the utmost value in pursuit of his plan monte cristo at once communicated with madame de roncagne at the refuge in civita vecchia begging her to bring annunziata to rome without an instant's delay 
she promptly responded by appearing at the hotel de france with her protege and the count arranged an interview between the latter and young massetti in his salon when annunziata accompanied by the superior of the order of sisters of refuge entered the apartment and found giovanni waiting for her there she flushed deeply and began to tremble courage my poor child said madame de rancogne soothingly courage sister annunziata said the count who was also in the salon have no fear all we wish in this peculiarly unfortunate matter is to get at the truth hear what the viscount has to say in his own behalf that is only justice the flush on the girl's handsome countenance was succeeded by an ashen paleness but she eventually managed to obtain control of herself casting down her eyes she said i will hear what the viscount massetti has to say but he will not he cannot deny his shameful and dishonourable conduct towards me giovanni hardly less affected than the girl who supposed herself his victim advanced to her and took her hand she did not refuse to let him hold it in his but studiously refrained from looking him in the face annunziata said massetti humbly i do not deny that my conduct towards you in the past was altogether reprehensible and unpardonable i do not deny that circumstances so shaped themselves that i was made to seem a wretched despicable criminal in your eyes but annunziata i stopped short of actual guilt and as heaven is my witness i had no hand either in your abduction or the horrible events that accompanied and followed it this i swear and this is god's truth annunziata lifted her eyes and gave him a searching glance i understand your anxiety to clear yourself she said slowly with a stain on your name you cannot marry the count of monte cristo's beautiful daughter it was a keen cutting thrust and made giovanni wince but he recovered himself instantly i am anxious to clear my name that i may wed zuleika he replied steadily and firmly but i am also anxious because i am innocent of all criminal action innocent of your abduction of your dishonour and of your brother's blood annunziata do you still decline to believe my solemn assertions i would gladly believe them if i could responded the girl but alas i cannot i saw your face when your mask fell from it that dreadful night in the forest i heard the tones of your voice afterwards in the hut guarded by the bandits what more convincing evidence could i require you were mistaken annunziata you were fearfully mistaken cried the young italian overwhelming despair seizing upon him and crushing the hope in his heart he could not convince the former flower-girl he could not even shake her convictions he had failed with her as monte cristo had previously failed at the refuge in civita vecchia up to this time he had continued to hold annunziata's hand but now he dropped it as if it had been some venomous serpent annunziata was deeply affected but her emotion arose from an altogether different cause she felt her shame and disgrace and was besides horrified at the idea that she had once hung upon the honeyed words of such a scoundrel as in her view the viscount massetti had proved to be monte cristo was now thoroughly satisfied that giovanni could effect nothing with annunziata and that a further prolongation of the interview would only be fraught with additional suffering for both the girl and young massetti he therefore requested madame de rancogne to take her protege to her apartment and when they had quitted the salon said to the viscount we must trust this girl to the lawyers and judges giovanni they perhaps may be sufficiently shrewd to shake her testimony even should old solara elect to maintain silence on the subject that vitally concerns us 
at the appointed time the trial of luigi vampa began in the judgment hall of the vatican which was crowded to its utmost capacity both men and women being present and striving to push forward so as to obtain a glimpse of the notorious brigand chief and of the first witness annunziata solara cardinal monti in person presided assisted by two subordinate cardinals in the portion of the hall railed off for the use of the bar sat monte cristo and the viscount massetti with their lawyers the best and most acute advocates in rome while just without the rail were m morel and esperance the latter having come from paris expressly to attend the trial though at his request his testimony was not to be demanded of him just within the rail and close beside maximilian and the son of monte cristo valentine and zuleika were seated both closely veiled near them sat madame de roncagne and the unfortunate annunziata solara clad in the dark grey habits of the order of the sisters of refuge their white faces plainly visible beneath the nuns bonnets of spotless linen they wore peppino sat beside the count there was a low murmur of conversation in the judgment hall as the audience discussed the probable issue of the trial and expressed diverse opinions though all were agreed that whatever might be the decision of the court in regard to the abduction and conspiracy luigi vampa would not escape punishment for the crimes he had committed in his capacity of chief of the bandits presently cardinal monte arose magnificent in his princely apparel and glittering jewels waving his hand for silence his gesture was instantly obeyed and the entire hall grew still as death then the cardinal resumed his seat on the judicial bench and turning to the clerk of the court commanded him to proclaim the session opened this was done whereupon the cardinal said in a voice distinctly audible in all parts of the vast apartment bring in the accused a moment later luigi vampa entered a raised enclosure serving the purpose of a dock in the custody of two stalwart and thoroughly armed military policemen his face was ashen but he glanced about him nonchalantly and defiantly when his eyes rested upon monte cristo and the viscount massetti he smiled in a peculiar sort of way as if he felt convinced that all their labors would be in vain suddenly he saw the two grey-robed women in their linen nuns bonnets starting slightly as he recognized annunziata solara but otherwise evincing no emotion the men and women in the distant portions of the hall got upon the benches craning their necks to see the accused and there arose a murmur a faint hiss that was promptly checked by the vigilant court officials who were marching here and there with their long white staffs in their hands and their black caps upon their heads then cardinal monte again arose speaking in a deep impressive voice luigi vampa prisoner at the bar said he you stand here accused of many grave crimes but the charge which the court will first consider is blacker than all the rest that charge luigi vampa prisoner at the bar is that you abducted and afterwards seduced a peasant girl named annunziata solara and in collusion with her father pasquale solara conspired to throw the onus and suspicion of your crime upon an innocent man the viscount giovanni massetti what say you luigi vampa prisoner at the bar are you guilty or not guilty not guilty your eminence responded the unabashed brigand chief at this there was another murmur in the hall which was promptly suppressed as before accused you can take your seat said the cardinal vampa did as directed the policemen remaining standing at his sides with drawn swords in their hands let the first witness be called said the cardinal addressing the clerk of the court that official arose and called out in a loud voice annunziata solara the former flower-girl came forward slowly and timidly and went upon the elevated witness-stand where the accustomed oath 
was administered to her by the clerk again there was a general craning of necks the women showing the strongest anxiety to behold the girl who was said to have been vampa's victim in a low faltering voice annunziata proceeded to give her testimony she repeated her sad story precisely as she had done before entirely exonerating the bandit chief and throwing the whole weight of the crime upon the shoulders of the viscount massetti this was the reverse of what the audience had expected and the murmur of surprise was universal the prisoner glanced at monte cristo and massetti with a radiant look of triumph the viscount's lawyers then took the witness in hand but shrewd and able as they were they utterly failed to make her swerve even a hair's breadth from her evidence she returned to her place beside madame de rancogne confident that she had done her duty and uttered not a single syllable that was untrue peppino followed her he repeated almost word for word the details he had given the count of monte cristo in paris his recital was so vivid so circumstantial that it made a wonderful impression both upon the court and the audience when he spoke of old pasquale solara's infamous sale of his beautiful daughter to luigi vampa the male auditors could scarcely restrain their indignation and the women fairly screamed with horror the utmost efforts of the court officers being required to force them into anything like quietude another sensation was caused by peppino's exposure of the nefarious conspiracy by which the innocent young viscount was brought and kept under the suspicion of murder and abduction when he concluded his narrative and quitted the witness stand he and vampa exchanged glances of bitter and vindictive hate and it required all the strength of the policeman in charge of the prisoner to keep him from leaping from the dock and attempting to take summary vengeance upon the fearless and outspoken witness the viscount massetti now took the stand he gave the full history of his acquaintance with annunziata solara from the meeting in the piazza del popolo to the encounter with vampa in the forest and the administration of the oath of silence speaking with such evident sincerity and feeling that his testimony acquired additional weight thereby the brigand chief watched him closely listening to his testimony with a contemptuous smile when the young italian returned to monte cristo and resumed his seat his pale visage was a mass of perspiration and great agitation had possession of him call pasquale solara said the cardinal to the clerk after referring to a paper upon the desk in front of him pasquale solara cried the clerk immediately there was a stir in the audience and four soldiers of the swiss guard advanced towards the judicial bench bearing a stretcher upon which was extended the emaciated form of the aged shepherd as her father was born pastor annunziata uttered a cry and arose to go to him but madame de rancogne gently pulled her back into her chair whispering to her that he was in the custody of the court and that she could only see him after the trial was concluded when the requisite permission would be obtained for her old pasquale was lifted from the stretcher by a couple of soldiers and aided to mount the witness-stand he was so faint and weak that it was necessary to hold him in an upright position after he had with great difficulty mounted the stand even then he trembled like a paralytic and it was some moments before he could answer the questions addressed to him vampa regarded him with intense anxiety eagerly leaning forward to catch the feeble almost imperceptible sounds that issued from his lips may it please your eminence said old pasquale painfully pausing after every word i am a dying man the hospital physician who has accompanied me and is now in the judgment hall assures me that i can last but a few days at most i have been a great sinner but i do not desire to go before my angered god with all the weight of my iniquity upon me therefore i have resolved to speak to tell all i know the spectators in the body of the hall shuddered old solara's voice did not reach them 
but they felt instinctively that some dreadful revelation was either being or about to be made monte cristo and massetti half arose in their seats they were near enough to grasp the purport of what the shepherd had said and its effect upon them was absolutely overwhelming they had expected that pasquale would either tell a cunningly fabricated tale calculated to shield vampa or take refuge in stony stubborn silence but instead he was going to make a clean breast of the whole terrible crime annunziata had also heard and was listening for what should follow with a countenance almost as white as her nun's bonnet madame de roncagne caught her hands and held them firmly she too was startled beyond expression by old solara's words and feared the effect of further revelations upon her protege zuleika valentine monsieur morel and esperance were too far away from the witness-stand to comprehend a syllable but like the spectators in the body of the hall they divined what was on the point of coming holding their breath in fear and expectation as for vampa he could hardly be kept still his fingers worked nervously as if he desired to strangle the dying witness and he glanced at him with the flashing eyes of a ferocious tiger brought to bay old pasquale continued amid the deepest silence i do not seek to shield myself vampa is guilty both of the abduction and of the plot to ruin the viscount massetti but i was his tempter and to me he owes his crime however with the murder of my son lorenzo i had nothing to do the chief alone is responsible for that but i tempted him with the beauty of my poor daughter annunziata greedy for gold i sold her to him the abduction was proposed by me and executed by him the plan to throw young massetti under suspicion also originated with me vampa and myself carrying it out together in forming the plan i was actuated by a desire to obtain vengeance upon old count massetti for a wrong he did me in the past now your eminence you know the whole black history pasquale solara ceased and sank back into the arms of the two soldiers who were supporting him totally overcome by the terrible exertions he had made in delivering his crushing testimony and lay there a helpless quivering mass as they were about to remove him from the witness-stand a sudden thought occurred to him and with a herculean effort he straightened himself up making a sign to the court that he had something further to communicate speak witness said cardinal monte in response to this sign your eminence resumed the shepherd slowly and painfully i wish to say yet another word i received my death wound at the hands of the viscount massetti there was a quick stir among those who heard this unexpected accusation and a score of eyes including those of cardinal monte and his associates on the judicial bench were instantly fixed upon the young italian who glanced at monte cristo and the lawyers with a look of consternation the count was about to address the court in explanation when old solara who had paused to recover breath added but i richly deserve what i received and it is fitting that i should die by the hand of the man i sought to ruin the wound however was dealt me in a perfectly fair duel and with my latest breath i shall exonerate the viscount from all blame in the matter as i do now the concluding portion of old solara's last speech was a surprise massetti drew a long breath of relief it was scarcely probable that he would be prosecuted by the roman authorities for fighting a duel with the shepherd under the circumstances and the wounded man had voluntarily removed every suspicion of foul play from him monte cristo and the lawyers cast congratulatory glances at the young italian his rehabilitation now only needed vampa's conviction and sentence to be perfect and it could not for an instant be doubted that they would speedily follow the effect of her father's testimony or rather confession upon annunziata had been startling it completely shattered all her convictions placing her misfortunes in a new and horrible light 
the viscount was innocent as he had steadily asserted and her parent stood revealed to her in all his moral hideousness he was a monster a demon he had made his fearful revelations only when death was upon him and reparation was impossible besides there was nothing noble or elevating about his remorse it was thoroughly characteristic of the man altogether selfish induced solely by the fear of consequences in the world to come annunziata felt as if all faith in humanity had been withdrawn from her and as she gradually realized the full meaning of her father's words she closed her eyes and with a gasp sank fainting into the arms of madame de rancogne who hardly less shocked and surprised than the poor girl herself used every effort to revive her finally succeeding in the little group consisting of zuleika valentine m morel and esperance uncertainty prevailed for some moments they had been unable to catch what old solara had said to glean more than a general idea that his testimony had been against vampa as soon however as his emotion permitted him to do so giovanni went to them and communicated the glad tidings zuleika was almost overcome by the immensity of her joy and with difficulty restrained herself from embracing her lover directly in the face of the august court and the assembled spectators valentine was ready to weep with delight and her husband felt as much triumph as if he had won a decisive victory over the combined enemies of france as for esperance he was both enraptured and ashamed enraptured that the dark stain was removed from giovanni's name and ashamed that he had been so blind and unjust as to wrongfully suspect him when the gist of pasquale solara's evidence was whispered around among the audience the court officers were powerless to suppress the expressions of horror and enthusiasm had the shepherd not been closely guarded by the soldiers he certainly would have been torn to pieces and trodden under foot so great was the tide of popular indignation against him at last however the tumult subsided and cardinal monti addressing the brigand chief said luigi vampa prisoner at the bar you have heard the testimony what have you to say in your defence vampa forced to his feet by the policeman replied doggedly and sullenly nothing cardinal monti then turned to his associates on the judicial bench and a brief conference ensued after which he arose and facing vampa said solemnly luigi vampa prisoner at the bar the judgment of the papal court is that you are guilty first of the murder of lorenzo solara though as he attacked you the crime has been placed in the second degree second of the abduction of annunziata solara and third of conspiracy to indelibly blacken the character of a worthy roman nobleman the viscount giovanni massetti luigi vampa prisoner at the bar the sentence of the papal court is that you be taken hence back to your dungeon in the castle of st angelo there to undergo solitary imprisonment for life as this sentence renders it unnecessary to proceed to an examination of the other and less important charge against you that of robbery on the public highways and of maltreating your captives your trial is now at an end luigi vampa prisoner at the bar may god have mercy upon you and bring you to repentance and ultimate salvation cardinal monti resumed his seat amid loud murmurs of applause and satisfaction when these died away the clerk declared the court adjourned the convict was removed and the audience slowly dispersed madame de roncagna and annunziata solara immediately returned to the refuge in civita vecchia where the poor girl lay prostrated for many weeks after his confession of his infamous deeds she had no further desire to see her despicable and degraded father monte cristo and his party rode joyously back to the hotel de france in the count's barouche that evening no happier persons existed upon earth than giovanni and zuleika end of chapter twenty nine chapter thirty of monte cristo's daughter by edmund flagg this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty joy unbounded 
the news of the result of luigi vampa's trial spread with the utmost rapidity throughout rome and occasioned the wildest rejoicing still further augmenting the popularity of monte cristo and captain morrel who were credited by the roman populace with having brought about the dreaded brigand chief's conviction and inspired his sentence everywhere while the vast importance of old pasquale solara's testimony was recognized and admitted the wretched shepherd himself was execrated as an unnatural heartless father as a diabolical scoundrel without a single redeeming trait the fact of his having turned state's evidence saved him from the heavy hand of the law but his mortal wound would soon rid the world of him and this circumstance occasioned hearty congratulation in all quarters the morning succeeding vampa's trial a messenger arrived at the hotel de france from the count massetti bearing a brief note in which the aged nobleman begged his son to come to him at once giovanni exhibited this note triumphantly to zuleika and the friends who had labored so untiringly and successfully in his cause and together with the count of monte cristo and m morrel immediately repaired to the palazzo massetti in monte cristo's barouche the old count received his son with open arms and cordially greeted monte cristo and maximilian giovanni said he frankly i admit that i was wrong that i was led astray by what seemed to me to be convincing proof my pride and honour revolted at the stain apparently cast upon them and i acted as almost any roman father would have done i acknowledge that i was hasty that i proceeded to extremities without due reflection or examination these admissions in the presence of your noble self-sacrificing friends cost me dear but you observe that i do not shrink from them notwithstanding the deep humiliation i humbly ask your forgiveness and restore all i have taken from you again you are my beloved son and heir the old nobleman paused greatly affected his eyes were full of tears tears of mingled contrition and delight the viscount's emotion was such that for an instant he was unable to reply he however recovered control of himself with a mighty effort and said in a voice tremulous with his colossal joy father i have nothing to forgive appearances warranted all you did and i can only thank heaven that the truth has been developed before it was too late with these words he threw himself upon the old patrician's neck the count embraced him drawing him to his heart and their tears mingled together for giovanni also was weeping now slowly and as if reluctantly releasing his recovered and rehabilitated son the count turned to m morrel captain he said i owe you an ample apology for my haughty and imperious treatment when you stated to me the object of your mission to rome i tender it at this moment and venture to hope that you will accept it even though it comes at the eleventh hour count replied maximilian i should be worse than a boor did i not accept it here is my hand in token of my renewed friendship and esteem old massetti took the captain's proffered hand and pressed it warmly you fully sustain the reputation of the great nation to which you belong said he with the utmost cordiality you are as noble as you are generous count answered m morrel bowing profoundly you flatter me say rather that i am a french soldier and as such never shrink from my duty no matter in what shape it may come as you please captain returned the aged nobleman with an agreeable smile to my apology i must however add my gratitude for all you have done to a giovanni and in the expression of that gratitude i must include madame morrel of whose heroic exploit in the Colosseum and subsequent devotion to my son in his hour of mental darkness i have heard maximilian again bowed profoundly advancing to the count of monte cristo the elder massetti said now your excellency it is your turn your name and deeds have long been familiar to me but to whom are they not familiar still though you have frequently honoured rome with your illustrious presence never have i had the pleasure of meeting you until this happy day when i too am included in the long list of those who have received 
overwhelming benefits at your hands edmund dantes count of monte cristo i owe to you my son's restoration to sanity brought about by little less than a miracle a blessing almost as great as his rehabilitation for which also i am on the endless roll of your debtors monte cristo bowed but made no reply my debt vast as it is continued old massetti is i learn to be yet further augmented by an alliance between our two houses and i need not tell you that this increase of my obligations will be a burden of joy that i shall accept with thanks to heaven for the signal favour shown me monte cristo repeated his bow and said you ratify the compact between our two children then count massetti with more delight than i can express replied the latter enthusiastically may i ask another favour of your excellency he added suddenly certainly said monte cristo somewhat astonished and casting a look of inquiry at his venerable host in that case resumed the aged nobleman i would like to welcome your daughter immediately to the palazzo massetti she shall be sent for without an instant's delay answered monte cristo giovanni return in the barouche to the hotel de france and bring zuleika to your father the young man joyously obeyed and in a very short space of time monte cristo's daughter came timidly and blushingly into the presence of the count massetti leaning upon the arm of her betrothed whose countenance fairly shone with happiness the youthful pair were accompanied by madame morel when the presentations had been made the venerable patrician stood for a moment contemplating his future daughter-in-law so this is zuleika he said at length she is a beautiful and charming girl and i do not doubt that the attractions of her mind are fully equal to those of her person my child he continued addressing monte cristo's daughter i welcome you to my home and to my heart make giovanni as happy as i know he will make you now my children accept a father's blessing the young couple knelt at the old man's feet and he extended his hands above their heads when they arose he took zuleika in his arms and tenderly kissed her in the general joy valentine was not forgotten the aged count renewing to her the expression of his gratitude he had previously made to her husband in her behalf it was ultimately arranged that the marriage contract should be signed within a week and this formality was complied with in the presence of many of the young viscount's relatives of monte cristo mercedes monsieur and madame albert de morcerf esperance and monsieur and madame morel mercedes and the morcerfs having come post haste to rome to take part in the auspicious event monte cristo gave his daughter the dowry of a princess and his liberality was fully matched by that of the count massetti who settled upon giovanni a fortune equal to that of some oriental potentate the marriage took place in rome and was a grand affair the wedding festivities lasting all day and far into the night the happy occasion had the character of a public rejoicing for the populace grateful to the count of monte cristo and maximilian morel for the suppression of luigi vampa and his dangerous outlaws who for years had been the terror of rich and poor alike paraded the streets in vast bodies in honour of zuleika's nuptials with the man whom the notorious brigand chief had so nearly succeeded in overwhelming with irretrievable ruin and disgrace from a very early hour in the morning the palazzo massetti was surrounded by cheering and enthusiastic throngs and by eight o'clock the vast gardens of the massettis were thrown open freely to all who chose to enter the preparations there were on a gigantic and princely scale huge tables had been placed in various broad alleys and literally groaned beneath the weight of the abundant and inviting refreshments while vast casks of excellent wines were on tap an army of servants waited upon the people liberally supplying them with the appetizing edibles and the exhilarating product of the vintage the papal and french flags were everywhere displayed in company and the beauty of the decorations of the gardens was such as to excite universal wonder and admiration the health of the viscount massetti and his charming bride was drunk thousands of times amid acclamations of delight but throughout the whole colossal assemblage perfect order was preserved the military police on duty finding their occupation a sinecure 
immediately in front of the palazzo massetti a triumphal arch had been erected it was covered with the intertwined ensigns of rome and france and at its apex bore an appropriate motto formed of creamy white orange blossoms and scarlet roses the interior of the palazzo rivalled in dazzling splendor the most superb and gorgeous vision that ever entranced a devotee of hashish while dreaming under the potent influence of his favorite drug in the principal salon were gathered many personages with whom the reader is familiar all in festal attire the count of monte cristo and his beloved wife mercedes their friends maximilian and valentine morel esperance mademoiselle louise d'armilly and monsieur and madame albert de morcerf many noble relatives of the groom were also present to say nothing of hosts of acquaintances old count massetti who seemed rejuvenated and whose venerable countenance was wreathed in smiles of joy moved about among his guests the happiest of the happy presently a door was thrown open a valet announced the bride and groom and giovanni entered proudly with the lovely zuleika hanging upon his arm her beauty heightened by her blushes and diffidence she wore a magnificent robe of white satin that a queen might have envied and the radiance of diamonds of inestimable value flashed from a tasteful necklace that adorned her pearly throat upon her night-black hair rested a wreath of orange blossoms and her flowing bridal veil was fastened back by a sparkling emerald pin a murmur of admiration and approval arose from the guests as they beheld monte cristo's daughter and noted her unequalled charms the procession to st peter's was witnessed by compact masses of spectators who loudly cheered the bride and groom and hailed with tumultuous applause all the well-known personages as they in turn appeared within the vast cathedral the concourse was immense but was kept at a suitable distance by uninformed ushers the pope himself united the young couple in the holy bonds of wedlock having consented to do so in consequence of his high esteem for the massetti house the oldest and most aristocratic in his dominions and out of consideration for the count of monte cristo whose wonderful history had penetrated even the august portals of the vatican at the close of the impressive ceremony his holiness blessed the newly made husband and wife and immediately afterwards the grand organ burst out with a triumphal peal an unseen choir chanting a jubilant marriage hymn whereupon the bride and groom surrounded by their bridesmaids and groomsmen esperance holding the first place among the latter received the congratulations of their relatives and friends that night there was unbounded festivity at the palazzo massetti the glad celebration terminating with a grand ball and an elaborate supper the next morning giovanni and zuleika started upon an extended bridal tour which was to embrace the most interesting portions of europe eventually they settled in paris as they had originally decided where giovanni bought a magnificent residence furnishing it with all the luxury of the orient their married life was as happy as it was favored and zuleika never had occasion to regret that she had clung to giovanni when all the rest of the world seemed to have deserted him esperance and the young husband at once became as fast friends as ever and the dark cloud that had separated them in the past was completely forgotten the count of monte cristo and mercedes continued to lead a tranquil and charming existence in the palatial mansion on the rue du helder upon the elevation of louis napoleon to power the count who distrusted him and his schemes abandoned politics and the agitation of public life forever contenting himself with doing all the good in his power and aiding the needy in a quiet unostentatious way his daughter and her husband spent a great deal of their time at the family mansion and the count and mercedes acquired additional delight thereby albert de morcerf his wife and mademoiselle louise d'armilly remained inmates of the monte cristo residence aiding not a little in promoting the comfort and happiness of their generous and agreeable hosts maximilian morrel and his wife returned to marseilles but they were frequently in paris and never failed to find vast enjoyment and gratification in the society of the monte cristos the massettis and their friends 
giovanni's father died a year or two after the marriage of his son leaving him his title his palaces his vineyard and all his colossal wealth but even this change in his condition did not induce the young count to return to rome where the sad associations of the past were too powerful for him old solara expired in the hospital at rome a few days subsequent to vampa's trial and annunziata lived long with madame de rancogne in the refuge at civita vecchia drawing what consolation she could from abundant good works peppino and beppo remained in the service of the count of monte cristo leading honest and upright lives walmann and siebecker were caught red-handed in the commission of a murder and ended their iniquitous association on the scaffold the knife of the guillotine ridding the world of two extremely dangerous wretches as for danglars he suddenly disappeared from paris one day and was heard of no more End of chapter thirty end of monte cristo's daughter by edmund flagg